record, there we go. Okay, hello, if you're watching the recording, apologies, you missed the first three slides. Um, there wasn't actually anything that interesting on those three slides, so it's fine, you can always look back through. Um, yeah, about Embassy, so we are a newly founded student organization. Um, our purpose is to bring together students from multiple disciplines, including things like medicine, science, engineering, commerce, business, um, into a space where we can all jointly explore medical technology. Um, and the reason we do this is because currently at, you know, the University of Melbourne, there are very limited opportunities for us to really engage in this quite interdisciplinary space. Like, for example, me as a medical student, um, I can't really explore much engineering or much um, um, data science within my medical degree. Um, and so Embassy is this organization that really tries to solve that by bringing everyone together and giving everyone an opportunity to engage in this space. Um, we've got three domains of activity. So first, our projects. Um, so a lot of you guys here are already part of projects, which is great, but basically projects are an opportunity for people to solve real world clinical problems in small student led teams. Um, and that's really exciting. We also have a whole series of workshops on topics like intro Python, bioinformatics. Um, this as well counts as education. Uh, and, and the whole point of education is to upskill people on matters of medtech. And we also run a whole series of events um, throughout the year as well. So we are very fortunate to have partnered with the Center for Digital Transformation of Health, which is a new um, center founded at the University of Melbourne as part of the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. Um, so this center has very generously provided us with their support, their time and also their funding. If you ate Subway today, you have them to thank. Um, thanks, Wendy. <laughs> Wait for Wendy at back. So, um, Wendy, Wendy's the director for the CDTH, and she's been working with us throughout the throughout the start of this year into planning sort of events like this, but also we're very excited to be working with them in the future on any possible other collaboration paths. Um, right, so what actually is a grand round? Like, this might be a term that's unfamiliar to some of you, and, and that's fine. So to explain, it's a term that comes from clinical medicine. So, so a round or when doctors do a round, it's basically when they go on their morning rounds, like they go to check up on the patients to make sure like they're okay and to make the plans for the coming day. Um, and then you get these grand rounds, which, you know, originally literally just meant like a big round. So basically like a lot, lot of doctors coming together um, to, to, to look after a patient. But then gradually over time, it sort of developed into this, really this educational forum or educational seminar where, where um, like in, in, in say a hospital where everyone's invited to attend and, you know, there might be a presentation about, something like like a, like a topic or an issue or a patient. Um, it's basically just like an educational forum where things are taught. Um, for the med students amongst you, this guy in the middle is Sharko, so Sharko's triad. Um, this guy here in the back is Babinski, so Babinski sign. And then this guy here is Tourette's. So those are names that you might recognize. Um, anyway, moving on. So basically, yeah, so basically like this is a this typical sort of patient presentation where lots of people are invited to attend an educational seminar. Um, so we plan on running these grand rounds every month on a weeknight. Uh, we, we plan for all of these, COVID permitting, to be in-person and also catered. So that's like a, just an incentive for you to come because you get free Subway. Um, and it will be recorded and also posted online as well after. So if you really can't make it, that's so fine. Um, the whole point of a grand round is to provide technological upskilling. So, or rather technical upskilling. So on any sort of digital tools or data science general ideas, we might also talk about medical topics and biotopics as well. Mainly the aim of these grand rounds is for project team members to come and upskill themselves. So this is why we would sort of semi-require you to be here if possible, uh, because this is really a forum designed for your benefit. Um, as you progress through your projects, we think that topics taught here are going to really help you um, do well in those projects. And that's so, so that's, that's one part. And the other part of our grand rounds, we want them to be project team reports. So every month we would require that every team make a short presentation, you know, five or 10 minutes long, um, like a very lab, lab, lab meeting style report. Um, we think that's quite important for you to exercise your communication skills, but also your ability to take in feedback and also take in questions. Um, that's part of, you know, the scientific education that we try and bring to you as part of our organization. Um, so this is why, you know, like the grand rounds are basically designed for you project team members, but also open to anyone else who wishes to attend as well. Cool, so at this stage, I might hand over to our three projects. So obviously like our projects have only just recently constituted. So there's not real like, updates to really give here, but I think this would be a good chance for each of the projects to just introduce what they'll be doing for the next year and also introduce the personnel as well going forward. Um, Carl or Poe, do you wanna come up? Yeah. And you can hand over straight to the next 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 project lead as well. Okay. 
Um, where's the mic? <laughs> oh, in the computer. Okay. Oh, it's a new computer. Yeah. 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 All right. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Poe. This is Carl. We're the project leads for the BCI project, which is applying machine learning on our neurological data. And we just finished recruiting. So here we have some medical students, some biomedical engineering master students, uh, and computer science people as well, and one physio, which that's pretty cool. Uh, and the project scope for the next month is going to just be, oh yeah, I see. Um, establishing team structure, get everyone to know each other, that kind of stuff, catch up on literature, get excited about the project, and actually decide on what we're doing. Yeah. Any questions or feedback so far? Sorry? Yes, so I know we have plans on getting people to type without using their hands. That would be pretty cool. Uh, and I'd like to get people to start looking at uh, prosthetics and wheelchair applications. Yeah. Um, so I'll just add, you know, uh, the project team is not small um, and we appreciate everyone who applied for our project team and we really try our best uh, to fit in their need uh, with what our project team can provide. Um, and uh, yeah, so it took a bit longer than expected because we have a pretty overwhelming amount of applicants uh, and Per and I really enjoyed <laughs> going through that process, yeah. uh, even though we were a little bit delayed. Uh, <laughs> cool. Radiology. Oh yeah, tag. <laughs> okay. All right, so hi guys. So we're the radiology team. My name is Rory. This is I'm Chang. Chang. Yeah, nice, nice to meet you, Chang. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Nice to meet you, Rory. Yeah. 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 All right. So um, yeah, uh, we're calling the radiology project, and uh, we have some uh, team members here today as well. Um, so we have Rahu. Just give the, everyone a wave. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mustafa. Yeah, and Sebastian. Yeah, very nice. And um, yeah, so essentially the update we have is we talk with the mentors, so we have a better idea on what the data is gonna be about. We haven't had our hands on the data yet, which is what we'll be working on in the next month. So, uh, uh, so the lab has like existing label data to work on uh, bone density. For example, um, looking at a portion of uh, a head CT to determine something for bone sensitivity to work out like falls risk or um, uh, progress of osteoporosis. And um, there's also a 10 years worth of uh, medical reports, uh, which can NLP can be performed on. So the data comes in the form of DICOM CT scans, x-rays and um, imaging reports. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So the plan for next month, so we hope to get everyone on board with the, um, the Austin's um, radiology data sets and start playing around with some data a bit later on, perhaps like in a month's time where we can um, finish onboarding. That's when we can start accessing the data and try to explore what it is. Um, and during this period, we will have enough time to decide um, what sort of project we wanna do, potentially select from the ones that Roy has just mentioned, the natural language processing or the bone density. And there are always some other um, potential projects that we're thinking about as well. And during this month time, it's also gonna be an opportunity for upscaling. We will be reading up on some of the existing literature as well as playing around with the current libraries such as TensorFlow, so just familiarize with the, um, the libraries that are available. Yeah, so that's it for radiology. Any questions? No? All right, <laughs> fantastic. Cool. All right. All right, so Carl is back to uh, talk about the Surgical App Project, uh, which is ongoing, uh, which still has ongoing recruitment. So if you're tuning in and you want to find a project, this is a good opportunity to go on our Facebook and website to get recruited. Um, so the uh, Surgical App is going great. Um, it's, we've got partnership with Western Health. Um, and uh, we're currently starting our prototype uh, for our patient facing front end app um, for to improve post-surgical outcome and you know, highlight post-surgical management for these patients. Um, currently uh, you know, settled on our project lead who is going to be Edmund, our medical student, 
uh, and Zakaria, who is going to be uh, our tech lead and programming lead. Um, and that's about it. Please uh, come join the project. <laughs> Okay, right. So um, I'll take over from now um, to officially start with the workshop content. So I'll just give a brief introduction. Um, Daniel over there and I are the grant round facilitators. So um, I'm currently doing a Master of Data Science at the University of Melbourne. I finished a Bachelor of Biomedicine, Medicine. So um, I feel like this would be, hopefully my background will also be helpful in um, helping the med students as well as the, as the project teams to um, upskill as well as um, help with all the other activities um, tonight while Brian is delivering the content. And um, Brian, uh, Daniel, he's doing Master of Biomedical Engineering. Would you like to introduce yourself to us as well for a little bit? Uh, yeah, well, I do biomedical engineering. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm also part of the coding, coding <laughs> workshop uh, officer, so yeah, well, it's almost over now, so don't really need to join us now. <laughs> right. <laughs> next Wednesday. Yeah, Advertis for our workshops. Um, next Wednesday we'll have the coding workshop. Um, held by Daniel, and we'll be definitely helping with the activities of the event tonight. So um, I'll jump into the goals for the night. As we can see, a lot of our project teams are just started. So today is um, about basically about getting started for your project. When you do have a great idea, um, where should we start from? So first, when you form a team. Usually we'll need a space to work together. Well, um, in the physical world, maybe you want to get into a media room, but um, in the digital age, we may also be able to collaborate online. So the first point will be creating your own collaborative space once you have formed your team. And second, um, once we have um, had the space, everyone will be contributing to the um, collaborative space. So what if we accidentally done something wrong or um, what if we um, get a major update? We want to keep a history of our work. That's um, not only about um, getting prog progress in your project, but it's also about say protecting your intellectual property um, to keep track of um, say when you're um, using your documents for regulatory, regulatory purposes, you do need a history of your work. And um, revert if, if possible, if you make any mistakes. And that's what we call version control. And Brian will talk a, a bit more about this um, today. And lastly, we'll um, build a standardized environment for your team. So that is um, um, an example of version control. We can version control a lot of things, your files, your data. Um, and today we'll use your environment as an example because um, different teams so different, um, different team members, even though you're part of the same team, you may be um, setting up different environments for this uh, project, but it would al al always be good, good to work on the same grounds. That's why it's usually preferred to build a standardized environment for your team and so that you, your code can be re reproducible anywhere, anytime, and by anyone. And um, this will be a brief timeline. We are running a little bit late, but um, we'll start from the collaborative data science. What, how, and why? Um, introducing ELN stands for Electronic Lab Notebook. That's a collaborative space where you can keep everything and um, communicate with your team members on there and add everything on there. And then the activity will be creating your first um, own electro electronic lab notebook. And um, then we'll move on to some of the very common version control tools. So um, some of you may have already heard about it. It's called Git. And um, we'll learn about Git and Brian will talk more about it. And lastly, um, the compute environments is an example of the version control. And um, this may, um, so moving from Git, um, we'll define and version your own environment. Shall I just that yeah. No worries. Cool, and that's basically our timeline and I'll hand over to Brian, um, who will be our keynote speaker of the night. He's an associate professor um, in specializing in health and biomedical informatics. And um, he's part of Center for Digital Transformation of Health. And um, welcome, Brian. Oh. Thank you. Right, cool. Um, Okay. All right. 
There we go. Oh. All right, so um, call me Brian. Uh, don't call me Dr. Chapman or <laughs> anything like that. Uh, you can refer to Dr. Chapman in the back. Um, okay, I thought just to tell you a little bit about myself. So I've got a little quiz here. And so we'll see how good you are at accents. So um, one Canada, two USA, three Scotland. So um, just hold up number of fingers here. So one, two, three, go. Okay, so we've got uh, Canada. No one said Scotland. A lot of a lot of Canada. And is that because you're afraid of offending the Canadian? <laughs> um, I mean, okay, let's just let's just think probability here. So there's 400 million people that live in the US <laughs> and there's like 30 something in Canada. We have very similar accents. So if you're just guessing no other information. But we're in Australia, right? Yeah. And we're a country. Yeah, let's, I don't know. I, I think we can't, anyway, okay. So, all right, I, so I'm from the USA. No one guessed Scotland? Okay, I just, I, I had to come up with three, you know. Okay, I thought New Zealand, but that would be a giveaway, right? Okay, so, okay, within the United States, I'm from Utah, I'm from Florida, I'm from New York. Okay, one, two, three, go. We've got a three, a three, a lot of ones. And I'm guessing those are people who have looked up my profile uh, before, because if I'm doing my argument, I mean, Utah is like 3 million, uh, New York's 25 million, Florida is like 20 million. So that was a, it would have been misleading you for, to get the right answer based on what we did on the previous one. Okay. Yeah, how many people could pick out my accent as being a Western American accent versus a New York? <laughs> you know, Florida. I, ha I haven't I haven't watched enough like the Sopranos recently. Oh, that's New Jersey. Um, okay, politically, I could be described as an asymptotic anarchist, a devoted Democrat, a reluctant Republican. So one, two, three, vote. Come on, let's get oh, zero. What's a zero? You have to choose. It's like obligatory to choose. Okay, we got. Okay, it's ones and twos. My son always um, like complains that I'm not really an anarchist, but that's my goal. <laughs> so that's the asymptotic, you know, anarch anarchist part. Uh, when I gave my, my first talk here, when we were getting, I guess we'd already signed on the dotted line, but I wasn't actually here. My talk was entitled Punk Informatics. And so what I, I, I'm kind of really timid, but in my daydreams, I like to like dream about disrupting things. And um, what I have liked the most over the years is kind of empowering people to go off and do things. And so that's, you know, largely what I hope to, um, help you guys with uh, through our collaborations here. And finally, uh, two truths and a lie. You know, this game, you're supposed to pick out two of these things are true and one of these things is false. So you have to pick, uh, vote for the false ones. So I've had four malignancies. I have a black belt in ITF Taekwondo and I own two dogs. So one, two, three, vote. We've got a three, two, uh, so this is a little more spread out. Um, I think three is the winner. Um, I do own two dogs. They're sitting out in our car. If we take a break and people want to go see them. One escaped and was running up and down Berkeley Street. Um, <laughs> the other one we tie in a little better. Um, I have had four malignancies and that's kind of, I guess why I, I'm probably interested in, in medical informatics because I had two as a child. I was already stuck in my career by the time the other two um, came. And while I did do ITF Taekwondo, um, I quit before. <laughs> Once I, I went to this um, uh, uh, tournament and like I was young and I wasn't old enough to be in the old person category. 
and I was in the big, you know, the, the fat people category. And so it was a lot of really young, like massive people like beating me up. And that was the last time we, we did anything like that. Okay. So um, I see people not on their computers. So does it, do people, I wanted people to pair up. So if you uh, uh, don't have a computer, pair up with someone that has and we'll get um, going on this. And so if I go to, Okay, so you guys are all friends, right? No one is in a group that you know you didn't join a group and then you you already hate each other yet right <laughs> so uh, presumably you've got good relationships and you would like to maintain those relationships so when we talk about um tools for collaborative science i thought of like four things that we could think of that what would be our objectives um at the end of our collaboration well one you would like to remain friends with your collaborators i think um not very many people are friends with their PhD advisors. I don't know if that, that's, that's maybe not true, but there's, it's often the case that once you're finished with your collaboration with your mentor, you never want to talk with them again. I am friends with my PhD advisor. Wendy is friends with her, P I'm friends with Wendy's PhD advisor. Um, <laughs> he was on my commit, he was on my dissertation committee. So um, you would want to record the steps you take in such a way that you can A, support any claims of intellectual property, which was mentioned, uh, B, demonstrate scientific integrity in the process that you are doing it, and understand and explain the choices you made. So like right from the beginning, document, thinking eventually you're writing this, you're writing a paper. You should be you know, writing as, as you go along. Um, three, you should be able to replicate your own results. Uh, that is not as easy as it sounds. Um, and you also want to allow others to replicate your, re your results. And that's even harder um, than the first one. And the fourth thing is you want to recover from catastrophes. Um, so I'm not, does anyone else think of well, what's something else you'd want to, to come out of a collaborative um, research uh, you know, process? Okay, well, um, so all of these things are gonna, the tools we're gonna talk about are going to um, relate to this. So remain friends. So uh, this requires good communication tools and you guys are using Slack, you know, so uh, you're up on that. Um, project management software, um, maybe like Trello. I'm trying to think of what some of the others I've used in the past are. I wish I used them more. Um, a lot of what I'll talk with you about are just, you know, I wish I did this. Um, and following good practices that uh, tr try to outline below. Okay, so uh, record the steps. So this is the requirements of a scientific lab notebook. How many of you have been trained on how to use a lab notebook? A little bit. Um, I, I was going to bring one. I, I um, my senior thesis, I found my... Um, my lab notebook from 1991 to 1992, I was gonna uh, bring it, but you know, we would print things out like figures and we would sign, we tape it on and we'd sign. So our signature is split between the taped on and the original paper. So um, all, all of that. Um, so uh, one of the things that really kind of disrupted my career was uh, I was just my second year as a faculty member at the University of Pittsburgh and I got an infection in my finger and I had to have finger surgery. And I essentially couldn't write for several years. I could manage to type, but I couldn't write. And these things like these electronic lab notebooks um, that we're gonna talk about didn't exist yet. And it really disrupted my career in ways that I, I became a very bad documenter 
of, of what I was doing. And uh, so you don't want to um, go down that path. Okay, so there's, there's essentially two um, uh, tools to think of uh, for an electronic lab notebook. There are, there are others, but um, the first is lab archives. Now the university, of, this is a, a, a subscription site and the University of Melbourne subscribes to it. And so as a student, you would have access to it um, as does Monash and Latrobe looking at the other uh, Victoria uh, institutions. Um, and so if you're doing like an official uh, University of Melbourne project, this is probably what they would want you to do. Um, there's an obvious drawback to this from a personal point of view it is tied to your university account. So when you leave the institution, um, you lose access unless it's, you know, the things that are made private can be made public, you know, like when a publication is done or something like that. Um, but I, we have moved around a, a, enough because I'm always following my wife, you know, she leaves and then I like follow her. Um, there's a lot of disruption when you, when you leave institutions. And so I have as much as an institution will let me wanted to have my kind of intellectual contributions <laughs> in resources that I have access to outside of that institution. And so that is why I have primarily uh, relied on open science framework. And it is a, a lab notebook, um, electronic lab notebook, you know, all kind of the, the tools you'd want. And I can't, I can say I'm not an expert at using these. <laughs> Um, and so I think there's there's a lot of plugins and stuff that you can you can get. There's this uh, Nature article about um, how to select uh, a lab notebook. But I just wanted everyone now to let's um, go to Open Science Framework, and if you have not yet, let's create accounts. And um, I guess the team leads, the project leads. You should create a project and then invite all the members of your team to this. Um, this lab notebook. So if you come here, I am already um, logged in. Let's see. And for the imaging team, this is a CT, a head CT of myself rendered with um, Horus, I think. So. And while you guys are doing this, I'll kind of kind of blab, you know, blabber on. Um, I I don't know if technical people. I was learning how to use Kubernetes, and I was setting up Kubernetes networks to run Jupyter um, Hub servers on the university's um, infrastructure, and it would all crash. And I'd be up to like four in the morning, and I almost have it. I almost have it. I'm just typing away, typing away, and I get it working. And it's like, I'll document that in the morning, which I don't. Two months later, it crashes again. I'm like, where are all my notes of how I did this? And so I think that eventually I got smart enough that I'm like, aha, um, I guess October of last year, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make a wiki here about the steps that I took to, um, get this uh, Kubernetes Jupyter Hub um, thing working. And so then when I went to do it the next time, um, see if I, I, see it's gonna be embarrassing if I show you how bad my documentation is, but it was there, I'm able to go back. I'm seeing all the steps that I did, the mistakes I made. I, I had it here with kind of the play by play explanation of what I did wrong, um, which is a little different than a script uh, which is the final product, but maybe not with the, the explanation of everything that I want. Okay, so does everyone have their accounts made? Um, one thing that I forgot to do that's like when you guys are running these, has anyone told you about bringing sticky notes? Like the little, you know, 3M. And so when you're done, you stick a little piece of paper up. It's like a flag on the back of your, your screen. It's like, okay, I'm, I finished. And so then the, the instructor knows so they can move on, so. Just, just a tip for your coding uh, thing or whatever that's, that's, that's coming up next week. Okay, and so if I, if I go to a project now and I'm going to 
say student sense making. Uh, this is a project that's just kind of starting. Anyone at Northern uh, Clinical School? Any of the the medical people? Okay, Leone Griffiths is the um, um, the clinical dean. I'm working on this with her. So I had come here to contributors. And if I want to add someone, I had added her before, so I don't know why she's not showing up. So, um, I just have uh, Wendy as my default add someone. Okay, so I'm going to add her to the project. Is this actually going to add? And I can give her different permissions. She can read it. She can read and write. She can admit an administer. So basically, an administer lets you add, delete um, people uh, to it. OK, so that's done and I now have Wendy in this project and I'm just wondering where my other uh, person is. Um, there are plugins for tools. You can connect this to Box, Dropbox, Google Drive, GitHub. Um, and so you can uh, get integration going on with that. All right. That's probably all. Any questions about the lab, the electronic lab notebooks? Um, well, you know, you're putting me on the spot and I'll have to say that I'm, I'm ignorant. What I use it for is, you know, essentially the wiki, but it has things like you can make, you know, persistent digital objects. Um, essentially, you know, I, I want it to be a lab notebook that I don't lose. And in a collaborative setting, the other person can contribute to so that I can document what I'm doing. Um, if, if I look here at what I have in this uh, current project. Um, I have started adding. So this is where we're talking about how people uh, make sense out of their and essentially not exclusively, but primarily in clinical settings. And so I got a bunch of articles from a psychologist colleague. And so I've put up the papers that she sent me. Uh, um, these are the papers that we as a group working on this project should be reading. Um, I could have put them in like a, a Google Drive, you know, the kind of thing. So it's not like this is the only solution uh, for that. Um, if I look at my other projects, um, I'm mostly making use of the wiki to document um, uh, decisions or, you know, some of these things like if I look at, um, um, Let's see if I kind of get down here to critical findings. It might just be, it's, it's, it's okay, where's my data located? Um, where are my scripts? Um, one of the things when I talk about disruption of, of moving as I was working with a radiologist at the University of Utah, and we were looking at what are the differences between what we call residents, I think here you call a registrar, a residence radiology report and a attending physician's radiology report. And we had an abstract at a meeting um, and she emailed me about it uh, the other day. And it's like, hey, did we ever turn this into a paper? I'm like, no, that's a great idea. I know I, I didn't keep the data because it had uh, identifiable information in it. So I made sure that that stayed in Utah and I didn't take it, but I knew where it was. Um, but I could not for the life of me find my code. And I knew I had it, you know, I'm searching my computer. Um, and so after that, I immediately, okay, I have it now in a Git repository, <laughs> you know, it's private. I think I probably didn't use GitHub before because I was worried about uh, identifiable information ending up at something outside the university. So you want to be, you know, careful about things like that. And I might have used a GitLab instance at the University of Utah to version control it, but I no longer had access to that. Um, so I use it basically as a wiki where you got timestamps and there's a, there's a persistence 
right? So, so just like, you know, the lab notebook where you're, you know, you can't erase things, you can't tear pages out. Um, these are set up so that there's a, a model of persistence of everything uh, that went on so that you have this legal, this legal proof. Um, any other lab notebook people want to pitch in? Wendy probably doesn't keep good lab notebooks either. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's go. Why aren't we using that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, when we when we when we started talking about Git, um, my PhD advisor, you know, we started using um, when I started working with him, he was writing all his grants in Adobe FrameMaker, which doesn't exist anymore. And now it's Word, but you'll ha he'll yeah, I'll have these emails from him, you know, grant blah 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 version G, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's thirty megabytes, and then you know, a couple of days later, okay, we now have version K. And so I've got like you know hundreds of megabytes of mail files that that he's he sent me because it's just a duplicate the file, put a new name on it, and and then move on. And that's one way of of doing version control, but um, not you know maybe the best way. You guys, all have now a common lab notebook. I should look at my screen instead of that screen <laughs> to to get things right. Okay. All right, so now we want to talk about uh, replicating your own results. Um, there's a book uh, that I actually have here, if people want to uh, browse through it later, called um, The Practice of Reproducible Research, Case Studies and Lessons from the Data Intensive Sciences. Uh, this is from the University of California Press. And um, so here's some excerpts I just wanted us to read through, and so I apologize that we're going to read it. but. Um, a research project is computationally reproducible if a second investigator, including you in the future, can recreate the final reported results of the project, including key quantitative findings, tables, and figures, given only a set of files and written instructions. I bet you 99% of published computational research is not reproducible because you're not provided the, enough data or the code to um, reproduce it. Okay, a crucial component of the chain of evidence is the software used to process and analyze the data. Modern data analysis typically, typically involves dozens, if not hundreds of steps, each of which can be performed by numerous algorithms that are nominally identical but differ in detail, and each of which involves at least some ad hoc choices. Okay, differ in detail. That can make differences. <laughs> And it's, it's almost shocking to think of it. And um, our son, that we have a son that's up at ANU right now, and he's taking a numerical analysis class and he just loves it. And so it's kind of fun talking to him. But just minute, like one part in 15, you know, 10 to the negative 15th, maybe cum errors accumulated over time in the, the US Iraq Gulf War in 1991, their, their missile defense system, just from these tiny numerical errors, resulted in a 600 meter um, error over time that they missed a missile that came in and it killed like 300 soldiers. Um, and that was just a, a teeny numeric difference in, in the code. So I may write my code and it works fine with NumPy version 1.13. But then when 1.17 is out, I don't get exactly the same results. And so one of the things we want to do is say, I didn't just use NumPy. I used NumPy version 1.13 when I ran this. OK. Um, okay. Using point and click tools rather than scripted analyses makes it easier to commit errors and harder to find them. One recent calamity, and this is like talking about using spreadsheets. Um, one recent calamity um, attributable to poor computational practice is the work of Reinhardt and Rogoff, which was used to justify economic austerity measures in Southern Europe, uh, like Greece and Italy. Um, errors in their Excel spreadsheet led to the wrong conclusion. If they had scripted their analyses and tested the code instead of using spreadsheet software, their errors might have been avoided, discovered, or corrected. Um, and the other thing is, 
if I did all my data selection by all this drag, you know, I select this region, paste it here, I cannot really tell you, you know, proof of the steps that were taken to get that um, data. So you want to you want to script things, okay? And so then here are three practices, key practices for reproducible data science. Oops. Um, clearly separate, label, and document all data, files, and operations that occur on data and files. Document all operations fully, automating them as much as possible, and avoiding manual intervention in the workflow when feasible. Uh, design a workflow as a sequence of small steps that are glued together with intermediate outputs from one step feeding onto the next step as inputs. Okay, so small pieces small automated pieces um, put together. Um, one of the things that I had a terrible time with when I um, started working with Python is, um, and if you worked in like a language like C, C++, you have to compile it. So the compiler finds all these errors in your code before you run it. Um, Python is interpreted, meaning it just, it doesn't compile it beforehand. And so it just looks at a line, runs it. And so I would have, you know, write this code and I'd say, I'm sure this works. And it's big and complicated. And like four hours later, you know, it comes to some spot in the code and there's an error and the whole thing's just gone. You know, so small steps, intermediate output, and then move on from there. Okay, any questions about these ideas of reproducible research? We have our master of data science, you must have this is in your domain. Do you have? Um, well, yes. Well, not that I learned was also to this um, side called the two smaller chunks. So when we saw this, like often uh, computers, sometimes you split them into smaller chunks and then you try each chunk first and then you put them back together. That's how we do it here. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about using version control. Um, it's probably the most important skill you can develop as a researcher. Um, even if you're not familiar with the term version control, you've probably used it. Um, a Word document, if you have track changes, that is a kind of um, version control. I can undo it. It tells me who, who made the change. Um, the problem with uh, like track changes uh, is the changes are in the document. And I, my, I think Microsoft has gotten smarter about this, but they accidentally, they, they put up all these documents on their website and people could go through the um, track changes and find all their like corporate strategy secrets of how they were trying to, you know, screw over Google or Apple or whatever, because it was all um, in, that, in that one document that, that they posted up there. Okay, so um, what we're going to use is, is Git, which is uh, currently the dominant uh, version control software. There is a very similar tool that's easy to, easier to use than Git, but it never really got traction Mercurial, so it's probably not worth um, worrying about. Um, previously, uh, dominant versions of uh, software control were Subversion, which has a really great name, especially if you're like in asymptotic anarchist um, and concurrent version systems, uh, CVS. Uh, I think subversion is still around. You still see, you can still get some things with subversion. The big difference between Git and subversion or CVS is subversion and CVS were all centralized systems. There was a server that controlled the versions of something and you pushed your your code up to that. And it was the server that kept all the information about the changes. Git is distributed. So when you have a Git repository on your computer, you have the complete repository. You are not dependent on any server or anything outside of your computer. There are conveniences of using something like GitHub. You can share code, there's backup, you know, it's, it's the code somewhere else but you can do version control entirely on your computer without ever having the internet or um, making use of a service like GitHub or Bitbucket or, or GitLab. Okay, so um, why do I tell you this history other than I like history? Um, 
the moral is you use Git now, but in five or six years, it might hopefully <laughs> it'll be something different, something e easier to use. Um, okay, so uh, you should all have um, Git installed, I hope. If you're a Windows user, it should be on there um, by, by default. If it wasn't, uh, let me know and it's, it's, it's more complex. The Windows users, I'm asking you to use Git for Windows, which comes with Git, a Git bash shell. So it, we can do all the commands. It'll look just the same as whether you're on a Mac or a Linux machine, if you, if you have the Git bash. Okay, um, anyone not have Git? You're looking nervous. Do you not have Git? No, I, well, I, I'm just, I just looked at the video. Oh, you're looking. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. okay, so the first, this is the most important piece of information about Git for tonight is this XKCD um, cartoon. So this is Git. It tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. Cool, how do you use it? No idea. Just memorize these shell commands and type them to sync up. If you get errors, save your work elsewhere, delete the project and download a fresh copy. That is not bad advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you go to the Git manual, which is online, it's probably you know, 300, 400 pages. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, I know how to get add, commit, push, um, pull, um, I can occasionally work through problems that, um, that come up, at, but I have many times given up, copied my local changes somewhere else, deleted it, recloned it, and just, just copied stuff over, just like this is described. Um, okay, so that's the first thing to remember. Git's hard to use. Don't try to become an expert before you, you know, just get the basic workflow done. And um, when things come along, you, you can you know, learn a little bit more. OK. The second thing to remember about Git is that Git likes text files and dislikes binary files. And so by um, I'm going to bring up my terminal here. And um, OK, so here I am right here. So. What I mean by a text file is just this. It's like just you know, Unicode characters. Um, and so if I, um, let's see here. So get status is gonna tell me what I, I've changed. So I've got two similar files here. And I'm going to do what's called a diff, which is this is going to be completely meaningless because they are so different. But this, this diff command basically goes through and it's telling me every line where something is different between the two files. And um, Okay, and so to make this a little more meaningful, uh, I already have this open, let's see. Okay, so I am going to just add something here. This is something. And then save this as environment 3 yaml And now if I do a diff between environment2.yaml and environment3.yaml, it's basically just showing me there's this one line where these files differ. Well, that's all that Git is doing. I have this original version of a file. I've made changes to it. I do this add, I do this commit. And it looks at the differences and it just stores that one small difference. It doesn't copy the whole file. Now, if I 
go to um, like Dropbox and I've got some PNG files here. Like let's see, CT. Okay, so I'm gonna do a git diff between CT6 grid.png, which is just a P, I mean, I could open that up um, and word cloud, if I type right, another PNG, all it says is that they differ. It doesn't show me where they differ, it just says that they're different. Okay, so Git keeps track of differences. If I have a binary blob of something like an image and I change it, Git's gonna just copy the whole new image in because that's all it can do. It can't reconstruct it. And so if you have lots of these big files that you keep changing or uh, mutating, um, Git duplicates it in your file, your repository gets, gets large and obese. So as much as possible, we want to only add things that are gonna be changing that are text files. We can add images to a repository, but we'd hope we don't change them. You know, so if I have like an image that I'm gonna have in my notebook and it's never gonna change, like it's your logo, put that in there, that's fine. Um, but if you're continually generating um, new binary data, you don't wanna be committing that to your um, repository. Okay. So the, the basic uh, Git workflow, I should have a step zero, which is initialize the repository. Um, and then I add code or add things that I've changed. Um, I commit changes and then I push and pull if I'm working with something remotely. So let's just kind of go through the steps of this. So in your, in your shell, so uh, Windows users, raise your hand, Windows users. Do you all know how to open your terminal in Windows? in your Mac. Okay, open a terminal. Uh, Windows users, open your git bash uh, um, shell. And let me make this uh, larger so we move along. And yeah, we're just, we're just going slow because I'm just a wordy person. I just like talk too much. Um, code. Okay, so I'm going to make a new directory, like just call it tonight. And I'm going to change directory into tonight. And it's just a directory. Uh, but I'm going to convert it into a repository by typing git init. Okay, so it's now a repository. And if I do git status, it says no commits yet on branch master. Okay, so what's happened? If I look at things, um, git has created this dot git directory. Now, if you're working in a Linux, a Unix environment like a Mac, Things that start with a period, a dot, are called hidden files. They don't normally show up if I list things. Um, and so I have to do a special command, like say, dash A list all files, and I see that there's a dot git. So that dot git is where all the information about the changes that I've, I've been working on come in. Okay, so let me, um, I'm gonna make like say a readme file. And um, in this file, I'm going to say, this is my repository of tonight, demonstration. So if I can't spell repository, or I can't type. OK. So now. Um, if I do like a get status, oh, I have this untracked file readme. So I, the, it's um, add, commit, push if I have a remote. So now I'm going to add it. And 
And now I'm going to commit it. Now committing is where you're going to start looking for the razor blades to slit your throats, your wrists. It sounds, I am, okay. I am currently obsessed with the TV show Snowpiercer. Anyone seen it? Um, the guy just had this slit his wrist. Okay. Um, okay. When I commit something, I have to provide a message. Um, now, if I don't, well, okay, I'm going to do it and it's all going to go nice. And what's the message? The message should be something that's useful to your fellow collaborator, whether the fellow collaborator is yourself or one of your team members about what are these changes that I just made. And so I'm going to just say, I created a readme file. Okay, I'm not going to push because I don't have anything remote. This is just my, my computer. Okay, that was beautiful. Well, I'm not happy with something. Um, my demonstration repository to illustrate the beauty of version control. Okay. So now I look at my get status. It tells me, ah, oh, readme has been modified. Um, so I'm going to commit that, but I forget to hit return and play along. I mean, this, this is, this is, this is hands-on, right? So I hit return. What? Did I not save it? Oh, I said it was changed. Oh, did I not? Okay. What? I, I didn't add it. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. So if I do get status again, it's like, oh, you got this modified file. Okay, so I get add readme. Okay. If I do get status, it'll say something like it's ready to commit, modified. Okay. So now I'm gonna get and I'm gonna commit it. Whoa! I'm in like an alternate universe. I've gone through the wormhole. Anyone know where I am? Get hell. No, no, this is this is long ways. Get hell is far worse than this. Um, I am in my my computer's default editor, which in my case is Vim. How many people know how to use Vim? So that ages me. I mean, I I use Vim all the time. This is this is an editor that was created before there were like little graphical windows that you could. You know, yeah, this is, I'm sure, before every one of you was born, you know. Um, I am in this editor. I'm in an editor that I move down with J's and up with K's and to the left with L's and to the, to the right with L's and to the left with H's. Um, if you don't know how, anyone get themselves there? Come on. Did you guys get yourself in? And you don't know how to get out of it, right? You know, so you're in a control Z, you're in hit your terminal, and now you've created um, Git Hell. So Git insists that you provide a message. And if you don't on the command line, it is going to open your default editor and force you to provide a um, to provide a message. And in this case, I'm like, okay, it's telling me something. I'm just going to do a colon X to save and and commit it. So that dash m and then some string is very important um and if you're working in a team like my messages um and if you look at my github repositories that are public you're going to just see piss poor terrible messages because it's almost always to me and i know i just have to have a string there or i'm going to end up in this editor but if you're working on teams of software engineers they're going to have rules about what that commit message should provide. Um, and so amongst your team, you should decide, okay, what are just some basic things we always wanna say about our commits? Okay. All right, so now um, I can see what's different on, let's see, I guess I committed it already, so I won't see that. If I make another change here, like um, adding something like, I should say more and save that. Then if I do a git diff, it'll tell me what's different 
between my current state of my code and what I had before. Um, if I want to just get rid of that, I can check out, and this, yeah, this is this is beyond tonight. We're just uh, uh, getting to the surface of things. That should have gone away. Uh, okay, let's don't worry about that. Okay, so um, that's on my own computer. I want to I want to be able to um, have this on GitHub, and so let's make a repository on GitHub that I'm going to put this on. And how do I move my Zoom thing so it's not in a totally irritating place? Well, I don't know. Okay. So let's go to GitHub. And I'm going to put this in my personal account. And so I'm going to make a new repository. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I thought maybe I would show you some of the really terrible um, commit messages I have, but maybe later. Okay, so I'm going to make a new repository. And I'm going to call it tonight. Um, I think it used to be you could only have private repositories if you had a paid account. I think you, you now can have a private without a paid account and there's academic things. Um, because this is embarrassing and I don't want the world to see it until I get it polished out. Oh. All right, so I'm going to make it private. And then it's like, do I want to initialize this? Well, I'm going to use the one I already created. So I don't want to add a README file. We could do that to explore um, uh, conflicts, but we're not going to do that. A dot, um, an add git ignore is something that tells git files to ignore. Um, and not be pestering you that they're not committed. So like images or things that you're, um, uh, you know, you don't want to commit or, so you, you can search for different languages and there's default sets of things that, uh, intermediate files that Python generates, et cetera. And then you can choose a license if you want. And GitHub actually has a, a, a website to help you choose a license if you want. And I'm just going to do like the MIT, which is basically you can do anything you want with this code except for sue me because it didn't do what you, you wanted it to do. Okay, so then I'm going to create the repo repository. Although actually, I'm not going to add anything at this point. Um, and so I'm going to create repository. And it's going to say, oh, okay, well, you can um, clone this. Or um, I'm I, sure I yeah, none of us, <laughs> none of us do. Um, or I can import import code from another repository. I'm gonna well, what I what I want to do is since I already have one, uh, the 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 tonight repository that I started on my com my computer, I'm gonna use these options right here to now connect that with this new repository that I I made online. So I'm gonna copy this. Uh, get remote add origin. And then I'm going to come over here to this guy and copy that. And I already had get there, so that was the problem with that. Okay. Um, so I've got a, a remote. So now if I do like I ask it, where's where's this remote looking? It's telling me now uh, this this is connected with github.com Chapman BE tonight for get and push. And then I need to um, make a branch, which is main. And we're not going to talk about branching tonight. And um, so let me do, do that. And now I'm going to push my changes up to GitHub. Oops.
Okay, so now if I let me come here, let me refresh this page. And this code that I had edited on my own computer is now up now up in GitHub. Okay, well, I can edit files here on GitHub. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to say uh, git demonstration uh, uh, repository. Oops. For the B, I, I'm always doing your guys' thing wrong. BMIS? MBI, MBSI, sorry, sorry, MBSI. Uh, grand rounds. Okay, I guess. Okay, now, I, now if I'm editing up here, it's the same as if I'm on my computer. I made a change to a file, so I commit it. And GitHub's nice, it's already given me, oh, you update, you know, if, if nothing else, I can just say I updated update readme.md. I can I can say more, but I'm just going to commit that change. Okay, um, so that's what my it looks like here. But back on my computer, um, joining. Right. Um, this doesn't look at all like. Uh, tonight, and what's the date, the 29th? But I'm going to do it like in a year, oops. US style, just to um, do something. And I'm going to come back over here, and I'm going to edit this again. And I'm going to put the date in in Australian style. Oops. And commit my changes. Everything's cool. Um, I'm going to come over here. I'm going to get my status. Uh, my readme's been modified so i'm going to add that i'm going to commit it say i added uh, the date to the readme okay and now i'm going to push it up to the, the the other place and you say whoa can't do this because you made there's changes up on github that you don't have so I can't push anything there. So I got to do a git pull. And it comes down here and it's like conflict. Uh, something doesn't, you know, they, they didn't match up. Now, sometimes I can make changes. And if the changes don't conflict, like I changed line five on one file, and line six on the other, it just merges them. But since I, I'm, I'm both online and on locally, I change line one, it doesn't know which version I want to use. So I have to resolve this. So I'm going to open a different editor. Oh, I'm going to open a different, different editor. Okay, so now it's, um, <laughs> And honestly, sometimes I get confused looking at these uh, th these diff files. But it's basically see we got these um, uh, we got this like saying okay here on the head it says tonight April 29th, but uh, down here we got these these equal signs. You've got 29 April 2021. And so I've got to edit this file to reflect which version of the changes I want to keep. So I'm an American and both the American and the, the Australian versions are not ISO versions of dates. And so we're both equally perverse. Um, and so I'm just gonna uh, delete all this stuff. 
and then I can save it. Oops. I need to stop looking at the, sc the screen up there, which is behind. And now I can add my README and I can commit it. Um, resolved, um, resolved uh, date format conflict. And now I can push it up. And if I come up here, I now have my, my final version. So that is the workflow, get, add, commit, push, pull, re resolve conflicts. Okay, we're, we're running late. So I was gonna have you guys clone each other's repositories and you know, create conflicts, but um, let's move on. Okay, so you guys are primarily gonna be using Jupyter Notebooks. Right, and um, Jupyter Notebooks look beautiful in your browsers and they look terrible on your computer. And the reason in the file system, and the reason is, is because they are um, JSON files. So I'm just gonna open in an editor a notebook that we're gonna look at later. And so, um, the, the main thing to say about this is it has to be a valid JSON file to be a notebook. And if I end up with conflicts inserted by Git and it'll look just the same, those you know arrow, arrow, arrows, this and the equals, if I try to go in there and manually fix that, it's highly likely I'm going to corrupt the JSON file because I'm going to um, uh, screw it up. So there are some basic tools we can use to um, make that um, easier for us. And I have a link here to a, like a whole ecosystem of tools to help with uh, version control in Jupyter Notebooks. And they did not include what I think is the most important one. And that is just the simple tool called NB strip out. Okay, so Jupyter notebooks are nice because in one place you have your code, the output from that code, and any explanation of you wanted about it in terms of the markdown cells. The problem is with the output. I could be doing imaging. I got my CT head slice there, that's an image. It's a bit of binary data that is in that notebook. Um, do I care in my version control? Do I care about output? Why not? Changes every time you run it. Well, and I can always re I can regenerate my output by just running my code again. So in general, with our version control, we don't want to put things into version control that we can just generate again. All right, so we, we want the code, we don't care about the output. Um, but that output is, is just a prime opportunity for conflicts. So what, uh, what MB strip out does is it strips out all the output from the notebook before it puts it in Git. It keeps it in yours, so you still have all your output, but what gets pushed into uh, Git does not have the output in it. So you've eliminated a major source of opportunity for, um, for con uh, conflict. So, um, and it's just a straightforward thing. It's a pip, it's just a Python project. So you pip install MB strip out. And if you go through the steps, um, you can you know, individually strip out files, but what you really wanna do is you can use get attributes to automatically strip out any um, output from a notebook before it gets committed. So you don't have to remember to clear the output. It'll just automatically do it. And you can either set it up for your individual, that individual Git repository, or you can set it up globally so that whenever I'm on my computer, if I add a notebook to a repository, NB strip out automatically strips all the output before it pushes up, which is I think what I've got it um, set up as. 
with this for myself for this for this global. Um, if you guys were going through the 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 um, get steps, did anyone get something like tell me who you are, like messages, like I don't know who you are, I don't know what email you have. Anyone get the set up? It's basically when you go to do a commit for the first time, um, it needs to know what your name is and an email. It can be any email. It doesn't have to be an email associated with, I mean, I use Bitbucket and GitHub and GitLab. So, hey, Alan, we've lost the, the screen on there. Okay, so um, let's chug along here because Time is sh short. And let me go to the, the last thing. And this is defining compute environments. Okay, so to sound old, back when I was your age, programming was hard but uncomplicated. And now programming is easy, but complicated. So what do I mean by that? So when I was your age and we had to walk uphill to school, both and back, both directions uphill, um, you basically had your language. You had C and everything you wanted to do, you wrote from scratch with the tools that C provided you, uh, which meant it was hard to write something useful. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so our programs are really simple and they just did, they did simple things. Um, but th that program was it. I didn't really have to worry about anything else. I could just give you my code and you compile it and, and everything was beautiful. Now, you know, you can, you can do in a day in Python something that would take us months in, in C. But the way that you're doing that is now that we have the internet and the internet can distribute software, it's like, well, you wrote a code for reading the images and you wrote a code for displaying them. And I, so I don't need to start it. I don't need to do that. I just need to find your code. I install it and I just call the function that you provided me. Uh, well, the problem now is what we were talking about before. There's, oh, oh, I found there was a mistake and I didn't really like how I did that this time. So this next release, I improved it. And so there's this just complex ecosystem that you have to keep track of. And so that is where things get complicated. And so when you're working together, you want to make sure that you're in the same environment. And if we're talking about reproducibility, we want to make sure that we, we describe precisely um, the environments that we're working in. And we're not going to describe precisely the, the environments that we're working in. Um, and kind of the best tools towards that are things like Docker and Singularity. And I highly re recommend you guys learn how to use Docker. So if you invite me back again, like I think I should show you how to use Docker. Um, but we're gonna go on a step towards not quite precisely defining, defining our compute environments, but defining an environment. And we're gonna do this with Conda um, because you all installed Conda. And so we're gonna use Conda environment files. So what a conda environment file does is it's a YAML file, which YAML is YAML ain't a markup language. So it's kind of this recursive name, uh, self-referencing thing. Um, so in this environment, we're gonna give a name. In this file, we say, what's the name of this compute environment we're gonna create? Um, where do we want um, Anaconda, Conda to find the software? That's the channel that we're gonna install things from what version of Python we're gonna use, um, and then what packages we're gonna install with Conda and anything that we want to install with pip that's not available with, with Conda. So I, um, here's, so here's an example of what a environment variable might, a file might look like. And this is for an actual project I have up on the Center for Digital Transformation of Health's GitHub page. So I'm calling a, a C. diff, which is like a diarrhea causing bacteria that is also the, the abbreviation for the, uh, the center. Um, <laughs> they tried to avoid that, but they haven't been able to. Um, uh, it's using Conda Forge, which is the, which is Anaconda is a company. 
and their official software versions of things is in the Conda channel. Conda Forge is the community packages that people contribute. So we're using the Conda Forge in this case. I'm going to tell it, I'm going to use Python 3.8. I'm going to tell it to install pip so I can use pip to install another thing. I'm installing matplotlib, which is plotting, dateutil, which is nice for working with dates, et cetera. OK, so this is the kind of thing we want to do. And um, so what I envisioned, and we're, we're completely out of time, so those of you that are in charge, tell me what you want me to do. Um, I could just kind of step through and not have you do the exercises now, or you can try to do and do one of these exercises. Okay. All right. So um, you're going to do a natural language processing uh, project. You do a little bit of Python searching and you see that there's kind of, there's these th three, there's, there's more um, uh, NLP tools in Python. There's NLTK, uh, which is a really kind of old standard from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Stanza is a new uh, tool that's out of um, Stanford which is, uh, relies on their Stanford NLP processor, which is another long old standard. And Spacey, which is out of MIT. So they're all from great snobby, high you know, prestigious universities. And so you don't really know what one to choose, but NLTK is the oldest and has the highest number. So, you know, bigger is better. So uh, we say, hey, we're gonna do an environment that's, that installs NLTK. So um, what I want you to do is create a repository and either you don't have to use GitHub, you can just do it locally like we did, but create a, rep uh, a repository that's NBSI NLP demo. And then um, if you do start with GitHub, which I guess um, I can do if we, if we go ahead, let me just copy this. I just mute. I was trying to click a new tab and I clicked mute because I wasn't looking at the. Okay, so I'm going to make another repository. I'm going to call it. Um, I'm going to make it public. That's fine. I'll add a readme. I'll add a dot get ignore. I'll say this is Python. I'll choose a license, which is MIT. I'll create repository. I need to get it to my computer. So I come over here, I click on this code. I copy, I never remember my passwords and I use um, LastPass so I can have good passwords. So because of that, I set up SSH keys so I don't have to know my password. Um, just a tip that if you're like me, you might want to do that. And I'm going to clone that repository and change directory to my MBSI NLP demo. And what I want is I want to, I want to create an environment.yaml file. Okay. And right now it's blank, but I need it to look Something like, where's the, oh, I stopped looking at the wrong screen. It looks something like this. So see if you can edit, create, take that environment.yaml file and create something that installs, use Python 3.9. I think I've got the like, instructions here. Um, use Python 3.9. Uh, create a name that's, you know, that uses your initials so that you can share these amongst each other um, and, you know, create your own computer. Use the default Conda channel instead of Conda Forge. And let's just install NLTK and Jupyter, Jupyter Lab. And then once you have your environment.yaml file edited to some basic level, Raise your, you know, raise your hand and we'll, we'll do the next step of, of creating the 
environment. So because I hate typing, I'm just gonna copy, paste, call it NLTK demo, or I'm gonna call it NLP demo. Okay, that's what mine's looking like. Okay, now what do I do with that file now? Uh, I'll go to my terminal. And let me just make sure that I'm okay. Okay, it's got all that stuff there. So I'm gonna do a conda environment. I'm gonna create an environment with the file that's environment.yaml. Now, Conda is a code distribution in Python is a disaster. And the, the official Python language has tried multiple solutions to it. Um, Anaconda came around and it's kind of become the de facto best way of in managing software um, installation. Um, so we'll talk about that later. Uh, okay, so it, cre it, it created this environment. If I now do like a con conda info dash E, uh, <laughs> here are all my, um, Conda environments and NLP demo was just created. So if I want to activate that, I do Conda activate NLP demo. And if everything worked right, I should be able to start a Jupyter lab. And I should be able to make a notebook. And these are all the different um, Jupyter kernels that I have installed on mine, Rust, Elm, Go, Haskell, Julia. Julia, by the way, has a really nice package management system that's based on GitHub. Okay, so I should now be able to install NLTK. So I should be able to import it. We're, okay, <laughs> step one, all right. So um, uh, yeah, so that, that worked, but um, what, what I decided is, you know, I played around with NLTK a little bit and I think I made a mistake. Um, and what I really wanna use is Spacey. So um, what I want you to do now, see, I've already given you the hint here, but time short. Uh, so if I just change my environment variable, my environment file, to instead of installing um, NLTK that I want to install Spacey, and I, let me kill that now. And now what I want to do is I want to, I don't need to create my environment, I want to update my environment. So now it should um, go and you know, try to solve this. Oh, uh, don't do this to me. Oh, I, oh okay, okay, let's see. Uh, it failed on me before. This shouldn't be. 
Oh, I know why. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. I want to install Spacey 3.0 because that's the latest. And we always want to be the latest, right? So, oh, okay. I can't find package Spacey 3.0. And I, and I was I was uh, skipping ahead, and one of the reasons I wanted to do use Spacey is I found that there's this really cool tool called SciSpacey that allows you to um, mark. It's been trained to mark up biomedical literature, so I want to install SciSpacey. And so what I'm going to do instead of because it's not in Conda yet, I'm going to install pip. And then with pip, I'm going to install spacey 3.0 and sci spacey. And see if that works. Ah, okay. I've, I've, I've Type something wrong. Um, oh, I need a dat. I need a. I need that right there. Okay. So my I that was invalid YAML. Oh, and just so you know, because Anaconda and PIP is kind of like the British and the Americans, you can't spell, the, and Australians, you can't spell things the same way. So in, in Conda, you specify a version with a single equal. In PIP, you specify it with a double equal. Okay, let's see if that works. I think if I didn't put anything on pip, it would install 3.0 um, as the latest. And I violated my own rules because I was saying, oh, we already have a working NLTK version. So what should I have done? Add, commit, tag it saying, this is the NLTK version. Why delete something that works? And then with Git, everything is always there. It never goes away. Like, so if you put your password in on accident, it is there, unless you delete your repository. Um, if you put PHI, personal health information in there, it is there unless you delete your repository. Okay, so it, it was able to build the new environment with that. Okay, well, you know, I just, you know, I'm not really interested in the literature. I'm interested in clinical reports. I want to do, I want to do NLP. So uh, cl on clinical data. So I learned that there's a, a new, uh, a really cool tool called uh, MedSpacey, which happens to be written by our son. Free software, no, no royalties. Um, so uh, I want to install MedSpacey instead. Well, I want to also install MedSpacey, let's put it that way. So I'm going to come here and um, if I just try to install MedSpacey, okay, let's go with this. Let's try to update my environment again. And what will happen is it'll, it'll just churn and churn and churn for 20 minutes until you get sick of it and you decide you want to quit. And if you look at the documentation, you say, well, it's only compatible with Spacey version 2.3. And then it doesn't, uh, MedSpacey is not, SciSpacey is not compatible with Spacey 2.3. Um, and so that's why if we wanted both, what do we do? We just create two different environments. And when we want to do the literature, we activate the one environment when we want to do the other. Now their documentation doesn't tell you this, but it won't build for Python 3.9 either. 
So we have to go to Python 3.8. And if we do this, and so this is a kind of trial and error, but ah, once I've solved it, I've committed it, I've made messages, I've written documents in my wiki on GitHub or my wiki in OSF and said, oh, I figured out it doesn't work with Python 3.9, so we're using Python 3.8. Um, we have this, and so now this is, this is all installing. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna sh show you the final result of where I got to in, in the project. And so if you step through this on, you know, on your, on, oops, on your own, um, I just got so many windows open here. Close that. And I'm gonna come over here to compute environments. And So when I wanted to um, make a environment that I could do NLP machine learning with, this is what I ended up installing. So um, I used Conda Forge, I Python 3.8, I installed Jupyter Lab, Spacey 2.3, which I did with um, Conda because the 2.3 was available. PIP, Seaborn to make uh, statistical plots, scikit-learn to do the machine learning, GenSim um, and Medspacey, and those things are the language tools, Keras to do the deep learning if you want it. And um, uh, so this, this is what I use to create uh, the environment. Now, if you look at that, there should be an immediate criticism that if we'd really spent a lot of time talking about this, that you should be able to make about my environment file. Remember, we want to, we want to tell people the, the, as precisely as possible, the environment that we did all this in. Right, I don't, I, I specified Spacey 2.3 and Python 3.8 but nothing else did I say what version uh, did I use for this. And um, so what versions end up getting installed? Well, let me uh, conda activate, activate. Um, what was the name of the uh, that Zoom thing that's driving me crazy? MBSI in that space. MBSI space. Okay, um, if I wanna see, like the, like the Python way would be to do pip freeze. And pip freeze lists every package, every Python package in that environment and what its version numbers are. And if I, and then there's an equivalent uh, conda export. Um, and I'm gonna just do this to environment three that uh, Conda, what did I do wrong? Hold on, I have them. Oops, I'm missing a page there. Oh, uh, yeah. What I really want to do is get here to this export. So if I do conda environment export, okay. this is the conda way. All right, so 
we specified, if I go back to that, um, this environment ver file, I, I guess I did it with um, Vim. This is Vim, by the way. So we specified kind of a dozen, a little over a dozen software packages that we said to be installed. But when we um, ask uh, Conda what's installed, we've got a 232 line file. So these are all the programs that were installed behind the scenes. So I can, so this file precisely defines what I use. So I could make this the thing that is specified that I add in my um, environment uh, variable. Um, all what, you know, essentially I don't, you know, if I'm doing something like this, I don't necessarily want to specify everything, but for the files that I'm asking for, for the packages I'm asking for, I should specify what version of those I want and then let the package manager figure out what's the compatible list of the underlying dependencies to make the, um, uh, make the environment. So I have a little package, uh, a notebook that um, you can look at at your own time, but let me just bring it up to show you what, that's the wrong one, let's see. Um, so we got MedSpacey, um, let me open this. I have a, a database up on Google Cloud with 4,000, the medical records from ICU hospitalizations are 4,000 deceased individuals. Um, it's publicly available, but um, I will send you the, I guess on your Slack channel, the username and password that I set up for it. Um, so this notebook basically goes through the workflow of finding chest x-rays uh, for people with and without a pneumonia uh, diagnosis. And uh, databases are great, but machine learning uh, workflows typically don't think in terms of databases. And so what they want, if I have like pneumonia, no pneumonia, if I'm using Keras or scikit-learn to train a model, basically what they want is I got a directory and in that directory are all my pneumonia cases and, and every case is an individual file and all my known pneumonias are in a different directory and they're all an individual file. So this basically takes the database, reads it out and writes it um, in, in, in that format. And you can kind of, you know, it lets you see a little bit about the importance of using a language model that's trained on medical language versus web stuff. Um, but that's that's the workflow and it's it's up there you guys can copy this add it to your um, repositories and, and 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 play around with it but sorry we went long we didn't even get to like get frustrated and and, and slit wrists and, and all of that so any questions the one thing i would do is if i were you i would go to this um uh repositories that, that were created on your society one right well let me let's let's go to that you can fork this and make it your own right so it's the societies i can come over here and say well i like this i want to be able to make changes and run with it as i want i can just come over here i, I fork it and now you see, uh, I'm here on my Chapman VE. I have compute environments. Now I own it. If I find if you find improvements, you can make pull requests and say, Brian, this would be better if you did this, or you found you have a spelling error. So there's a whole collaborative you know, workflow. But this was just the, you know, the kindergarten. Let's let's get you guys started. So. No questions, comments, feedback? Are you gonna invite me back again sometime? <laughs>
But I'll stop sharing my screen now. Sounds like you want to say something. <laughs> Yeah, so my plan was to show uh, data version control, and obviously we didn't have enough time, and I didn't have enough time to learn how to use it yet. But yeah, versioning but that, and it, and it, you would store the images like on Google Drive, and then have the metadata about them. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think and lastly, the environment is very important to um, set up again to emphasize the importance of a standardized environment, or else you can see that if you don't have the correct environment set up, then when you write the code and you're trying to import and practice it in the developer, you don't have any control about it. So I think that would be the major takeaway from my first presentation. All right, well, we'll look forward to working with you guys in the. In the